having a really powerful invitation to a conversation is what the purpose of the meeting is. Like you said, really being aligned to purpose, asking people a question where they go, yeah, I want to come and solve that problem with you. And I know exactly why I'm here and I know how I can contribute to this. So it's our job to really frame the invitation to a challenge, to a meeting in such a way that people go, hells yes, I'm in. Hi there. Oh, what's that for? Oh, sorry. I ruined your opening now. Uh, we got, we got to include this. Run it. Do it live. All right. We're going to include that. Daniel already ruined our intro, but that's going to be okay because we're going to have a great podcast. Nevertheless, <laughs> welcome, ladies and gentlemen, folks and people. My name is Anthony Taylor. This is the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Today, I am joined by Daniel Stillman. Daniel, how are you? Hey, you know, I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking. That. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can't wait to have a conversation and I get your all rightness. So for everyone else playing at home, Daniel is an executive coach, a conversation designer, and a lead facilitator at the Conversation Factory. Daniel, what does that actually mean? Which? Oh, all which of it. Part what, of that? What, do you, oh. what do you do? What do you do? What do you do <laughs> Explain for life? Explain your <laughs> Well, you know, uh, executive coach... <laughs> I'll explain executive coach. I'll take it step by step. An executive coach means that I am an indispensable thinking partner to leaders who are trying to accomplish more than they ever dreamed was possible. Mm. Uh, and my job as an executive coach is to believe in their dreams when they tell me them and then not let them skimp on them, right? Uh, to actually commit to them. Can you expand more on thinking partner? I've never heard that before. Yeah, I am. Um, I, I got that phrase from my friend Donna Markova, who wrote a book called Collaborative Intelligence. And some of us, and we're getting into like what it means to design a conversation, right? Like, like how do you think, right? Some of us are verbal, some of us are visual or self-proclaimed. Donna, and uh, I'm sorry for saying this, Donna, but the theory in education that you know, if you ask in a random adult on the street, hey, are you a verbal learner? Are you a visual learner? They're like, oh, I'm more visual. I'm more verbal. Uh, and if you Google this, there's a wonderful video that debunks it. There's actually, uh, people will self-report that they're one or the other, but there's actually what's really true. If you Google VARK, V-A-R-K, it's the acronym of like visual auditory uh, written with an R, not a, not a W, and K meaning kinesthetic or uh, body-based. The idea that, oh, we can diagnose what type of a learner someone is and then focus the lesson on them specifically is actually not the case. What research shows is utilizing all of them and uh, is, is a great way to help people learn and connect. And so some of us, uh, you think about where you have your best ideas, you know, going for a walk, you're taking a shower, right? That's because you're slowing down and you're taking a, a step away from your challenges. I, I always like to to joke, the best way to solve your problems is to walk away from them as long as you walk back to them, right? And I know for myself, it's really hard to put time in the calendar to think, right? And by, by paying money to me, people block time in their calendar to actually step away from things and think. I think with them, right? I help them develop and refine their thinking. We play the game between uh, I'm going to pull it out of them through good questions and I'm going to push them through good questions. I'm going to give them assignments to do and there's going to be pressure. No. Or we're going to slow down and we're going to find out what's really going on, right? It's that's that's what I, it's like. I'm a thinking partner to them. Mm. And they can call me, they're on a retainer, I'm on a retainer, which means they can call me as much as they want. So if they're like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, oh, I've got this presentation, right? It's so, I'm zero stakes, right? You think about how hard it is in your work to uh, get someone's read on something without it costing you politically, without, you know, showing something that's half-baked, and having somebody be like, dude, that's half baked. What are you thinking? To be able to say like, hey, so this is half baked. What would make it, you know, three quarters baked? We can talk through that. 
So that's, I think, valuable and important. And I, and I love having those conversations with the people that I coach. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, on your LinkedIn, you've been doing this a long time. You've got an education and you've got the practical uh, piece of it. Um, I, I really like what you talked about the, the, the cost of having those half-baked conversations because there is a cost. <laughs> Um, yes. and, and I don't think people realize it uh, in my own team. We have a up the mountain, down the mountain. I have a guy who Mike COO mm. talks to me about going things up the mountain and I have to be mm. careful not to go up the mountain with people who aren't ready to go up the mountain. But yeah. b- before we start talking about all of that, why is it important for teams to have good talk and why is it important for them to uh, talk effectively amongst each other? You see what I did there? I did. I like that. Thank you. Um <laughs> Um, and I can tell you a story about the title another time, but, uh, dude, That's a title. Is, Daniel wrote a book. It's called good talk. We'll pitch it's called it later. Good talk. I had so many other titles and this, this woman who, um, Alyssa Quark, who, uh, is an amazing author. I told her about it, not knowing she was an author at the time we've just met. And she was like, you know what you should call your book? Good talk. And I was like, what? That's a ridiculous title. And people, a lot of my pre-readers actually hated it. And they loved the subtitle, um, how to design conversations that matter. And, but good talk just looks good on a, the, the test was, <clears throat> how does it look on a, on a shelf, right? How does it look in the thumbnail? Anyway, so yeah, why do we need to have a good talk? Uh, the, the cost of a bad conversation is incalculable, like literally incalculable. Like there's studies that say like, oh, okay, let's interview uh, or survey, you know, a thousand senior managers and say, how many meetings do you have a week? How effective are they on a scale of one to 10? And let's estimate their salaries and let's let's take the percentage of waste and just add that up. And I think it was Gartner, it was Forrester, I should probably remember this, said it was like 37 billion. I think that's a little light because, you know, w- before we had the internet, you may remember this uh, since we're around the same age, like the idea that uh, the next, Einstein, the next uh, Amy Edmondson, the next Brene Brown could be in sub-Saharan Africa and would never develop their full potential because they lacked access to the tools to develop themselves. How much human potential is lost and wasted? It's incalculable. So if we think about a meeting where people don't feel safe to speak up and say their mind, what's 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 the cost of that it's hard to know right there have been there were there were tons of meetings about the covid epidemic before it became an epidemic where bad decisions were made where people weren't heard where people didn't feel safe to speak up right uh there are meetings all the time every day everywhere around the world where someone feels because they are the wrong color or have the wrong parts in their body that they shouldn't speak up or they they can't speak up or they'll be punished if they speak up right women generally speaking feel like they will be punished uh if they take on masculine characteristics of uh speaking their mind and having opinions because they'll be bossy or bitchy right and so what's it like in a world where half of the population approximately feels like, you know what, nobody really cares what I think. And if I speak up, I won't be heard, right? We're, we're literally running on half speed. So I think 37 billion is super duper light. Uh, the other example I love to give is uh, uh, the, the what's it, was it Kylie Jenner, the Pepsi commercial where she like, there, there was like a protest and she put like a flower in, and everyone was like, ugh, that's awful. And someone said, okay, to it. In fact, a whole group of people said, okay, to it. multiple people over multiple meetings said, yeah, let's do this thing. Right. So that's the cost is bad ideas getting put into the world. Um, that is the cost of not having good talk, uh, on a daily basis Incalculable. Yeah. Sorry for if that was too real, but no, but it's it's really true because I think, uh, you know, I, I'm also a facilitator and, and my job is to more or less convince people to say, hey, you need to talk about your strategy. And I highly recommend that you get everybody engaged in doing it. And, and you brought up this yeah. like, hey, this incalculable cost that costs the industry. But if we like make it like really real, like do your numbers on paper, like how much money are you wasting? 
Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting, so we're hosting a diversity and inclusion conference, and then people on one hand say, hey, uh, you know, we value diversity and inclusion, we like want to make sure we have women representation, and then something that I'm coming to grips with is when I'm expecting different things, I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, female co-workers, why don't you act more like me? Like, that's not kosher. Uh, <laughs> And so on one hand, you're trying to do one thing, but in terms of your actions, you're not sort of backing it up and having the, the maybe not necessarily different expectations, but the structures and systems that you have set up do not support um, th those people living up to their full potential. So um, how do you see that playing out in teams, like in a, in a practical nature, and how can leaders uh, s develop those structures and processes to... Uh, bring out the potential within their organizations. Yeah. I mean, like we're, we speak that language of facilitation when somebody learns that it's a word and a thing, I think is a really amazing moment. It's, it's kind of similar to uh, maybe uh, more than a decade ago when I started teaching design thinking to non-designers where they were like, you mean there's a structured process for like being creative and coming up with good ideas and making sure that they work and have value to people in the world. Like, I felt like this should exist my whole life and I can participate in this. This is amazing. And that's the way I want people to feel about uh, designing conversations to realize like, you know, there's the, I can structure. There are mechanical ways to change the conversation, like adding another interface to the conversation, like, having it on mural or on google docs like changing the turn-taking structures like making sure that people are quiet we have me time before we have we time just like really really basic things but the mindset of the host like that's this so this is where i i i talk about um i don't know if you're familiar with the concept of triple loop learning so, no uh triple loop learning is there's doing thinking and being so uh in one in one framework and so the the doing is like okay here's a recipe but we all know if you give someone a recipe it doesn't always work exactly the way they want it to they uh, they need to think differently in order to use a recipe like you, you're kind of cooking the whole recipe at the same time like you're thinking about the beginning middle and end of the recipe as you go through it and mm -hmm. i think that's a facilitation trick for sure i always tell people you need to draw the arc of the conversation think about the opening the uh, and the closing, how are you going to set the stage and how are you going to land it? Right. And when you hold that arc in mind, the beginning, middle and end, you can get there, but you also need to, that's also part of a, a different way of being, which is like, I am hosting this conversation, right? I am here. Do you want to be at a party where, uh, at your house where remember those, uh, people like you, I do this. You look in the corner, you're like, oh, they're not, uh, they're not talking to anybody. Let, let me introduce them to somebody. Right. Uh, when I, I, every year, um, um, maybe I can have it this year. I do a big eggnog party. I make about nine liters of eggnog, which requires 48 eggs. And um, over the years, this is, I've been doing it for about 10 years now. The real question is, what do you do with all of the egg whites? Because you only need the yolks for yep. making the custard base and the type of eggnog that I make. Uh, and one of the things I do is I make latkes because it's also a kind of, I'm Jewish, it's, it's a holiday uh, treat. I make these tiny latkes. And I know, and maybe I learned this from my mother, you put out a plate of food on the food corner and the, not everyone goes to the food corner. And so the food can kind of just sit there. But if you take out a tray of hot latkes and you walk around the room and say, hey, latke, latka latka they go oh thank you thank you for putting it directly under my face and i will totally have that and i will be less fall down drunk because i can't taste the alcohol in this eggnog true story and so to me i think thinking about meetings from a metaphorical perspective thinking about it like a party thinking about serving everyone thinking about serving things up breaking it down into smaller pieces like nobody wants to have a big five inch latka at a party right? They want to have a, a one inch latke. It is a lot more work for me to make 91 inch latkes than it is for me to make 35 inch latkes, but they all get eaten. 
and people love them because they're crispy and delicious. And so you think about your meetings, like how do I break it down into smaller chunks? How do I ask tighter, more thoughtful questions that take people step by step from the beginning to the middle to the end? And I think that's the biggest challenge I see with people structuring meetings is uh, as one person in my, took my facilitation master class said, agendas hide a lot of complexity and there are lies. And so there's you're like, oh, here are these six things that we're going to talk about in 30 minutes with 12 people in the room. It's like, well, how many topics per minute is that? And how much airtime per person per topic is that? Right. That, so that's, that's the doing differently. You, you can just use workshop math to do, to do differently, but the being of, well, I would like to have everyone get heard on every topic. That seems reasonable. As a host, I don't want someone to feel left out in the conversation. So well, what does that mean? How do you structure your conversation to make sure that everyone gets heard? And once you have that mindset of the facilitator, I think it's hard to go back to say like, oh yeah, we're just going to do a report out or something. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's Anthony here again. I just wanted to let you know if you're enjoying today's episode, I'd love it if you could give us a review and a comment to let us know where you're listening from. It means a lot to us. It helps us with the algorithm. It also helps us get into the hands of more people so that we can keep bringing great guests onto the show. So please do that. Also, if you or your team are planning a strategic planning offsite coming up, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to see if we're a fit to facilitate, to support you and your team getting on the same page and getting clear about where you want to go. So you can visit smestrategy.net or click the link in the description. We'd appreciate both of those things. And now get us back to the episode. Well, that's, I mean, there, there's so much stuff there. And I think it, so what I heard is it goes back to the mindset of the host. And that's why people host facilitators or hire facilitators, because if you don't hire a facilitator, it's our most popular podcast. If you don't hire a facilitator, you are the facilitator. Correct. And you have to have that, hey, do I want to hear everybody? Um, that outcome, <laughs> because it's yeah. an outcome mindset. And what I heard you say is that your meeting is ultimately limited by the mindset of the host. So are oh, you totally, yeah. Or do you want to participate? Do you want to lead? And then um, we talk about models in the pre show, but what mm -hmm. I really find interesting that you can put in your next book is this Lodka paradox, um, which <laughs> is if you just have, <laughs> Shout out Big Bang Theory. But if you have this, um, you know, big like I didn't, nobody will have it. So you need to make sure that it's uh, digestible and that if you're trying to do your mm. full strategic plan, mm -hmm. are you going to be able to do it in four hours? Well, probably not, not effectively. So you have to think of that design. So I don't know if there's Unless, anything I missed in there, but go ahead. No, but that was great. But if you if you take the Latka paradox and push it all the way to the other side, then it becomes interesting again. Everyone will come to a giant party where there's like a 40 foot hero or you were like, hey, everyone, I'm going to make the giant, the biggest latke ever, and then we're going to all eat it together. Then it becomes its own activity, hmm. right? I think that middle ground is uh, <laughs> maybe, Dang. I don't know if this analogy works or not, but <laughs> I was like, no, it is fun to dr just serve up a giant 40, you know, like we're going to, we're going to beat the world's record on decons on making and then eating the biggest hero in the world. That's so fun. If we tie that to team building, then that's because you have a shared purpose. If there's no shared purpose and everybody is just out for themselves, they just want the same, like they just want to eat. Exactly. So this is the classic truth about uh, meetings is no, you shouldn't have a meeting without a very clear purpose and a clear agenda. Now, what I would say is for in my conversation operating system, so like I have this mental model of I came from the world of design and of all sort of entered into the world of consulting and was like, oh, design thinking is a thing. They didn't teach design thinking in design school. They just taught us design. I had the mindset of, well, what am I designing when I'm designing conversations? Like, what does it mean to design a conversation? Mm -hmm. This, uh, I was confronted by this question, like in 2015, I met a group that called their facilitation and change practice conversation design. I was like, well, what does it mean? How do you do that? What is that about? And uh, thinking about conversations more structurally and like looking at these specific elements of designing a conversation for me, helped me break down the problem and think about it more clearly. And so, you know, that's where changing the interface of the conversation changes the conversation. Like, oh, we're not just going to talk with our hands. We're going to go on mural or we're going to be on a Google doc, right? We're going to change the turn-taking structures. We're going to change the power structures. We're going to give away and distribute more power. Having a really powerful invitation to a conversation is 
what the purpose of the meeting is. Like you said, really being aligned to purpose, asking people a question where they go, yeah, I want to come and solve that problem with you. And I know exactly why I'm here. And I know how I can contribute to this. So it's our job to really frame the invitation to a challenge, to a meeting in such a way that people go, hell's yes, I'm mm -hmm. in. Well, that's, and, that's a leadership skill. Well, engineers are good at that because they're, they are, they're taught they solve for X as far as I can tell. So they're very clear at that process and they have a structure. So I want to ask you about, you said operating system. I want to ask mm -hmm. you about design thinking, how you apply it, how you recommend it, uh, recommend it for people. And then you also talked about the interface. So uh, interface question, have you appreciated Zoom and the fact that it, everybody has the same size Zoom square? Do you find it mm. makes better conversations or worse conversations? I, I think the evidence shows that, um, well, one, people feel safer to speak up in a Zoom conversation just because we're in a safe place. Like I'm here in my house, right? I have safety. Uh, there is some evidence that shows that there you can have more balanced participation. We can also have too many people in a meeting on Zoom too easily. And then you have <clears throat> the facilitation math problem, the workshop math problem of too many people and too many people uh, observing rather than participating. But I think the fact that, yeah, there isn't a, um, what is it? My, my, my friend Fred Dust wrote a book called Making Conversation. I had him on my podcast uh, uh, a while back. He uses this phrase, spaces have a script, which I love. And when you go into a boardroom, a super long boardroom with a TV on one side, we know what's supposed to happen there. You know, who sits at the head of the table? Who hits, sits at the left and right of the head of the table? Who sits somewhere in the middle? When there's like, chairs around the outside of that table who sits in those chairs, right? We know what's supposed to happen in those rooms. And it's really hard. You've probably had this experience. You go into a company's offices to run a, a, a workshop or an offsite, and they give you a room where you can't have the kind of collaborative conversations that you want to have. Hmm. Like literally, if everybody sitting at that boardroom table stands up, there's no room for them to move around because <laughs> the walls are just kind of like squished in. It's terrible. So the space has a script. The script of Zoom is, you're right, everyone here has got a square and we're all equal. Uh, when people realize, oh my God, breakout rooms are easy. I can just shove people out and bring them back so quickly. It's so much more efficient than uh, when somebody, I would be doing a big offsite with somebody and they're like, oh, so here's this big room. And then these other rooms are like five minutes down the hallway uh, and, and, you're like, oh my God, we're going to lose so much time with the teams going out to these breakout rooms and coming back. Uh, we're in trouble. <laughs> so Can we just all keep them in the same room. <laughs> a, a quick thing for, for all you meeting organizers out here, because I've seen people like, hey, we're gathering 200, 300, 400, 500 people for these big yeah. things. It's like, there's so much you got to consider. And, and when yeah. you have a good facilitator, I'm not trying to sell you facilitation. I'm really just trying to get you to think about all of the processes because uh, Daniel, I imagine someone says, here's our outcomes, or if you're lucky, here's our outcomes. Here's what we yeah. want to work through. But the flow of it, the structure of it is so important. And it's just totally. so you get more value out of your meeting. And I imagine you see this, I mean, day in and day out. Well, totally. I mean, this is, goes back to your question about design thinking, which is like, uh, Design thinking proposes, and you know, you, if you do, if people are unfamiliar with it, you just do a Google image search of design thinking. Uh, you're going to see some hexagons. You might see some waves. The one you won't see. I, I recently interviewed Jean Lidka on my podcast. She has written many books about design thinking, and one of her, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in one of her books from like a decade ago, she poses four questions: What is what if, what wows, and what works, right? Those are four great questions. What is going on? What is currently happening in the system? Uh, what if we did this? So what are all the options? What are all the possibilities? Like, oh, which of these possibilities are the ideal ones or the interesting ones or the worthwhile ones? And then what works? How do we bring it to life? Design thinking at the, at the core, or one core, is like just very, very aligned with facilitation, which is like, what questions should I ask in what order, mm. right? Uh, 
how do I get to a good answer? Another design thinking question is like, oh, well, how do I discover, define, develop, and deliver, right? The double diamond of design thinking. It's going from thinking about the who and the why to the what and the how, right? It's just having a structured approach to the beginning, the middle, and the end of the conversation. So let's tie that in as all good tie-ins happen. See, that's what it says if we design this. We talked about uh, operating systems and we talked about models. Mm -hmm. um, what if you had to, um, you know, you wanted to be a thinking partner to a CEO, senior leadership team, and they're like, hey, we want to have better conversations. What's, what's a mm -hmm. model that we could follow or, or what's something that we can put in to have a, a, a structure for better conversations, whether it's uh, problem solving, whether it's around diversity mm -hmm. inclusion, whether it's around strategy, what do you yeah. tell them? I mean, the simplest thing would be to have everyone clarify the arc of the conversation for themselves, right? That just draw that arc of the beginning, middle, and end. Like, what's the big challenge and what would good look like, right? And what's, what, what can we do in the middle to explore? Open, explore, close, set, and land, and just know what your opening is what we're going to do in the middle to get us the outcome that we want. So there's another uh, a mental model. I mean, the, the arc is the simplest one, like just beginning, middle and end, open, explore and close, right? Just identify those three components for your process. Don't but sleep the, on that folks, by <clears throat> the way, that's, that's like three things, just like it's obscenely simple yeah. and so good. Beginning, middle, and just I really because you might be like, oh yeah, that seems obvious. Just write it down and then reflect on it because it's so obvious, and that's why it's so good because well, some people don't think like that. Yeah, well, and also sharing it with your team. Like I draw a visual arc for all of the workshops I do. A, so I can have that big arc, and then the little arcs. Okay, so here's my opening. What's my open, explore, and close? What's my beginning, middle, and end of the beginning? What's my beginning, middle, and end of the middle? What's my beginning, middle, and end of the end? And how do I get people to drop in? And how do I rocket them out at the end? Mm -hmm. This is on everyone to just not just think about, but to share your thinking with other people. The others, I have a, there's a 9P model. If you Google game storming and the seven Ps, <clears throat> I added a couple more Ps to make it nine. Uh, who are the people that are coming? Do I understand them? What place is it going to be? What kind of prep do I need to do? What kind of product are we, what is the outcome of this meeting? What is the purpose? What is our process going to be? What are the pitfalls? I think one of the biggest challenges with beginning facilitators or managers who need to have a facilitation mindset is thinking about meetings, not as a one-to-many right? Like me reporting and me orchestrating, but unleashing everyone's power by making sure that everyone speaks, everyone participates. And that is about changing your process and just, you know, really thinking about how do I make sure that the, the, the amount of things we're talking about and the amount of time we have to talk about them and the people who are in the room all make sense. And that I'm thinking very clearly about what would a good outcome be and do I really want to? Am I curious? Do I really believe that everyone in this room has something to contribute? And that's why I say the thinking and doing does not overcome the being. If you do not believe that everyone in this room potentially has a secret key to solving this problem and that you need to see everyone's answer and, and bring them together somehow, then it's don't have that kind of meeting, right? Yeah. Absolutely. That's why we, when we do strategic planning, we say, well, they say culture eats strategy for breakfast because that's the being over the doing. Yeah. Um, and then one sort of visualization I took from managers <clears throat> is like, they have to try to control this like locus. They have to manage yes. it, corral right. it. Whereas leaders and people who make things easier facilitate, they open up and then it's sort of limitless potential. Does that track yeah, with? Totally. And, and that's where I think the arc model you know, thinking about the big arc and the little arc is, is a leadership mindset. Say like, what's, and then, you know, so you draw the, the first arc, what does that springboard us to? What's the next arc? A leader says, here is the horizon. Here's our North star. We're going for it. And that is part of the arc is like, 
the, the, the purpose, the vision, the goal is out there. And I'm just drawing the arc and saying, here's some steps that I think will get us there. I don't necessarily know what there is, but we're going to find there together. So just as we finish up here, um, mm. we're recording this end of 2021. We're looking 2022, 2023. What do you see for leaders in the world of management, leadership, teamwork, collaboration, mm. society? You know, what do you see out there and, and what's the thing that you'd want our, our leaders to equip themselves with, prepare for, so that they yeah. can be best, um, the most successful as possible moving forward? Oh, dude, so many. One thing is look at your calendar. Like just everyone look at your calendar and ask yourself, is my calendar aligned with my purpose and my highest use? Am I having time for the conversations that I need to have? And one of those, we didn't talk about this, uh, you know, we, we talk to ourselves all the time. We, we need time to think. We need time for creativity. And uh, making time for our own thinking is the thing that's going to help us. Because I think everybody's calendars are filled chock-a-block full of meetings. And the best advice I could give, give to anybody is start having meetings with yourself block out that time. And if you keep uh, stealing that time back from yourself to give to someone else, ask yourself why. And if you have too many things on your plate, that's when it's start, time to start thinking about delegating more, changing the power structures of how you do your work and making more time for yourself to do the things that are your best and highest use. And that is certainly going to be a challenge as we, I think, go into this hybrid world where I remember someone invited me to have an in-person meeting and I'm like, oh my God, it's going to take me like an hour <laughs> to get there. And we used to just do this without thinking, right? Like, oh, I'm going to go have a coffee with someone and it's going to take me 40 minutes to get there and 40 minutes to get back. And I'm not going to do, be able to do anything in, the, in between. And we're still having a, the sort of pandemic calendar of nonstop Zoom calls, stack, 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 if you can't see his hand gestures. Right. So to, what I say is delete things from your agenda, give them to other people, only do what's the most valuable or important to you and find time to think for yourself. Because as we go into the hybrid world, I think the demands are going to become weirder, uh, just weirder. So that's, cool. I mean, that's it's simple advice, but really hard to take. Ah, I love it. That's, that's apt. Uh, where can people get a hold of you? Where can they get your book? Where can they just connect? Uh, a good talk. How to design conversations that matter is available wherever all fine books are sold. <laughs> uh, and uh, you, there's also an audio book read by yours truly uh, in this very room that I'm in right now. Uh, they can also go to danielstillman.com. Uh, they can link into me on LinkedIn. They can follow me on Twitter at DA Stillman. Uh, yeah, please reach out. And uh, if you found the book useful at all, I would like to know how and why, because sometimes it shocks me when people are like, tell me what actually wound up being uh, effective for them. I love getting those stories. I love that. It's a great feedback loop. Um, and your podcast is called, I'd like to listen Oh, to it's it. called The Conversation Factory. Yeah, where I interview folks who are designing conversations in their work and lives. And um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's my learning loop. It's where I go to learn. And so uh, I've, I had some amazing people on it and people should check it out. Perfect. Well, I had an amazing time today. I look forward to the world's largest latka. Um, and <laughs> really, thank you uh, so much, uh, Daniel. It's been a freaking awesome chat. And I really look forward to uh, having another one soon. Anthony, thank you so much for the great questions and the great conversation. This was super fun. It's all about the arc, baby. Uh, <laughs> folks thanks so much for joining us on today's episode of the strategy and leadership podcast my guest today was daniel stillman who's executive coach conversation designer and lead facilitator at the conversation factory if you enjoyed today's episode be sure to like share with your friends and with the people that you love the most and uh, i just appreciate everybody watching listening wherever you're at in the world so my name is anthony taylor this has been the strategy and leadership podcast thanks so much and see you next time